for the Rio Grande Oil Company. Police police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 119, regarding a series of thefts in the jet room at the spiny Texas ranch. Tonight's true crime story comes from Arizona, and at the same time comes confirmation of a new contract placed by the largest county in Arizona, Maricopa County, specifying that for another year, all sheriff's cars, all emergency cars operated by the county, are to be powered exclusively with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. This is a striking endorsement of the superiority of Rio Grande. In other cities, such as Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, they also specify Rio Grande Crack for all police cars because it operates so efficiently in city traffic conditions. It gives quicker stopping, faster acceleration, and creates greater power and speed than any other gasoline these cities can buy. But road conditions are entirely different in Maricopa County, Arizona, where sheriff's cars speed over an area of 9,000 square miles in pursuit of criminals and on official business, traveling mountainous roads, over scorching deserts where temperatures often reach 130 degrees. Under these trying conditions, Rio Grande Crack gasoline shows its superiority. The patented, exclusive Rio Grande cracking process creates a gasoline with definite advantages over other brands. A gasoline which is more economical and more efficient than any other. A statement which is proved by the fact that more police and emergency cars specify Rio Grande Crack gasoline than any other brand. Now it is our great pleasure to present former Captain M. Joe Murphy, now Detective Sergeant in charge of the Bronco Squad of the Phoenix, Arizona Police Department, and hero of the night's broadcast. Sergeant Murphy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Chief C.M. Johnson, my superior, is prevented by his official duties from appearing on tonight's broadcast. So he has requested me to pinch up for him. It places me in a rather peculiar position. Inasmuch as the story you're about to hear is one that I solved myself. There is nothing bloody or exciting about this case. No guns are fired and no lives are threatened. But then, a police officer's life is not all violent. Sometimes he is encountering cases which are downright amusing. And of all the cases on which I have worked during my 28 years as an officer, this story of the missing hundred-dollar nightgown here, missing hundred-dollar nightgown here, is amusing to me. I hope you will find it just as funny. One day, early in the spring of 1913, Chief of Police A.J. Moore at Phoenix calls his eighth detective, Joe Murphy, into his office. Sit down, Joe. Oh. All right, sir. What's up, Chief? Well, I got a job for you, Joe. You're just up at the spiny Texas ranch in the other part, County. I'm losing a lot of stuff from their room. I want you to go up there and get your feet. You'll be registered as a guest. As a guest? <laughs> oh, thank you. I get the mix with all those millionaires up there. Oh, sure, sure. No, no, no. I'm a copper, not a dude. Well, you'll get along all right. Oh, I don't see how. Well, you're going just the same. I'll get it home and get your bag packed and come back here in a couple of hours. I'll have your ticket ready for you. Huh? Oh, uh, by the way, I forgot something important. Uh, going to pay you for this. Oh, well, that's good to know. How much? Ten dollars a day and all expenses. Oh, and I still draw my regular pay here while I'm gone? Sure. <laughs> Say, I'd impersonate the Tsar of Russia for ten dollars a day. I'll see you later, Chief. <laughs> Same time, Detective Murphy reappears in the chief's office. Hi, Chief. Oh, hello, Joe. Well, I was afraid you'd miss your plane. No, oh, no, 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 no. I won't miss my plane. Not very long. I'll be there, all right. Well, uh, here's your ticket. Hey, what's the matter with you? What? You work like you've been drinking. I have. What? <laughs> Part of my disguise. Are you crazy? No, 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 no. Listen, Chief. I, I got it all worked out. Now, listen carefully. I am Thomas Whitney Jr. You see, I'm the drunken celebrity serving there. I, I'm going to find a taxi to take the bath and try to get over the habit. Uh, that is, try to get over both habits. Both habits? Uh, sure. 
I take dope, too. Oh, you take dope, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm a bad one, see. I'm such a junk dealer. A dope guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, that I can get by with anything I want to pull. Well, it sounds risky to me. Oh, no, there's nothing risky about it. Now, you just wild as Spiley Texas Ratchet. I don't want to be such a whip. There's a drunk girl young me in there, I can say. And I'll take care of the rest. A few hours later, Joe Murphy staggers into the midst of the exclusive diners at Tiny Pastor's Ranch. He hustles off the bed by the worried attendant. Next day, Murphy, still missing a hangover, is visited by Mr. Benton, the manager of the ranch, and Dr. James, the house physician. This is uh, Murphy, my eye. I'll towers with the Julia. Tell me, towers with the Oasis. This hope is Cincinnati, Ohio. Yes. I know all about that, Mr. Murphy. I am Benton, the manager here. Oh, you're the manager. Hi, boss. What would you say, Doctor? I don't have to make an examination to diagnose the case as alcoholic intoxication. Pack your things, Mr. Murphy. There's a train leaving for Phoenix in an hour. What? You are fired. How far? I requested Chief Moore to send me a detective, and he sent me a drunk. This is Mr. Benton. Have you ever made an arrest? No, of course not. Have you ever solved a murder case? No. Well, have you ever seen me inside of a jail? No, I, 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 of course not. What are you insinuating? Just say, say it would be a good thing for you to mind your business and I'll mind mine. Now, I've never managed the hotel. I don't intend to. I don't know the first thing about ice water and room service and vegetables and cheeses. But I do know the police business. Now, you just keep your job and I'll stick to mine. You're impertinent as well as unreliable, Mr. Murphy. The only thing I've done is been for a purpose. What's I using a half page to sign your name on the register last night? Yes, Rocky, I didn't use the whole page. I was drunk. Oh, you admit it. Of course I admit it. The guests are objecting. They all saw you. Well, that's what I intended they should do. Now, let me alone like I can get to work the other this stage. You'll do no work on this case. You're going back to Phoenix. I'll pay you for your time, and you can get the next train. But don't think you've heard the last of me. Ah, shut up, shut up, listen to me, Mr. Bessler. You're making me mad. Now, you hired me to come up here at $10 a day of expenses. Well, that isn't enough. My services will cost you $20 a day of expenses. You're drunker than I thought you were. Yeah, I'm getting sober every minute. You haven't heard the rest of this deal yet. I don't like that room you've given me, Mr. Benton. We're going to move here to the best suite on the rest. There's a sort of a suite that Mr. Thomas Whitley has squired a son of a Cincinnati soap millionaire. That's the way I have it. This is good. I'm not good. finished yet, Mr. Benton. You'll keep me in this luxurious style for ten days. During that time, I will not touch a single drop of liquor. And if at the end of the ten days I haven't captured your thief, then I'll go back to Felix and you don't know me again. How about it? $200 is cheap price for the reputation of your two bread. That's enough on it, I can't leave on a party like that. Who's your work, Doctor? Very well, Mr. Murphy. You're on. Yeah, you're a sensible man, Mr. Benton. Now, let's get out of business. Now, that's the whole story, tell you. All I know is that somebody's been stealing things from the guest rooms. Now, what has been stolen? What is in the church? Come on, let's have it open. Let's have it open. The church began about two weeks ago. Mr. Potter was the first to report anything missing. Well, what did he lost? A half dozen pair of silk stockings and an expensive kimono. Oh, Mr. Potter wears silk stockings and kimono, eh? Not Mr. Potter. Mrs. Potter wears them. Oh, oh, I see. Well, that's small stuff. I thought you'd really miss something. We are missing just $30,000 worth of valuables, of which Mr. Potter lost at least 5000 We'll be sued by the guests unless we reclaim oh. them. Oh, that sounds more like it. You say Mr. Potter is the heaviest loser, huh? Uh, <clears throat> can you put me into a suite next to uh, Why, the bridal suite is next to Mr. Potter. I'll say that. So, uh, now, uh, shut up, shut up. I'm giving orders. You have my luggage moved to the bridal suite and tell Mr. Potter to get up there right away. I want to talk to you. How do you like these accommodations? 
One, two, days go by while Detective Murphy keeps his self-imposed vigil in his suite. Sitting all day before his fireplace mirror, commanding a view of the entire interior of the potter's rooms next door. Then, in the middle of the afternoon of the third day, Mercer's watch is rewarded. He lays down the magazine he's reading as he hears the hall door of the potter's suite softly open. Watching intently at his mirror, he sees a beautiful young woman clad in an expensive negligee slip into the room, close the door behind her. Quickly, she crosses to the desk, clearly visible to Mercer through his system of mirrors. Like one accustomed to the place, she opens the desk drawer, takes out a wallet, extracts the money it contains, replaces it, crosses to the dressing table, removes a bottle of expensive perfume, takes a half dozen lace handkerchiefs from one of the drawers and glides out of the suite in one ruffled view. But he picks up his magazine, chuckling to himself, but sees as the gorgeous and unimpeachable Countess Bill. That night, Murphy breaks his custom and dines with the rest of the guests in the ranch dining room. But he sits at the table to one side and eats very little, for his eyes are on the Countess Curley, gaily chatting with Dr. James, the house physician. Dinner over, the pair wander down the path leading to the moon drenched desert. Murphy saunters along, just far enough behind them not to be noticed. A slow quarter mile from the ranch house, Murphy senses that he is being followed. Just off the path behind a giant cactus. Coming down the path behind him is a little man in a huge ten-gallon hat, stealthily peering in all directions as he advances, gun drawn, step by slow step. When his shadow is abreast of the swar, Murphy suddenly steps into the path in front of him. Uh, what's the big idea? Are you following me? Why, uh, well, say, uh, you better put that six-shooter away if I get hurt. Uh, what's it all about? Who are you? I'm the deputy here at the land. Oh, you're the deputy, huh? That's right, I heard of you. What can you probably have? Well, uh, what are you following me around for? Well, to tell the truth, you're under suspicion. Under suspicion of what? We've been missing things around the ranch, and the boss told me to keep my eyes open for suspicious persons. And you sure look like a suspicious person to me. Hmm. You know, you're wasting your time as a deputy out here. You ought to go to Washington and join the secret service. Well, uh, I'm studying for that. Oh, you're studying for uh, that. <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice when you get your diploma, won't it? Yeah, kind of. So, uh, what do you do around here when there isn't any deputying to be done? Oh, I wrangle dudes for the boss in the daytime. And uh, following around at uh, night with a drum gun, eh? Oh, not all of them. Only you see you're under suspicion. Uh, well, listen, Sheriff. Uh, as long as you're checking up on suspicious things, uh, take a look down there in the wash and see if that doesn't arouse your suspicions, huh? Well, let me run for a maverick if it ain't the doctor in the counter. Yeah. Looks to me like he's kicking us. Yeah, that's what they call it where I come from, too. Say, ain't that a pretty sight? Uh, <laughs> I can see you only work lovely detail up here. Uh, you don't seem to be interested in the duties of the vice squad. Uh, come on, I'll walk back to the ranch house with you. All right. I don't think we ought to interrupt the doctor and the countess, do you? No, I don't think the countess will feel anything tonight. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, nothing, she left nothing. Detective Murphy, easily enjoying his private little joke, next morning instructs Mr. Potter to place some marked money in his bill hole and leave it once more in the desk drawer. And to be sure to drop a remark within the count of hearing that he had forgotten. Shortly past noon, Murphy once more hears the door of the potter's seat open, looks up, sees the countess in the mirror. She takes the money plan from the wallet in the desk, helps herself to a dozen pairs of silk stockings and a silver ashtray. As she's about to leave the street, Murphy jumps to his own door, opens it as she's passing. Oh, I, uh, I beg your pardon, did you not? What? Oh. I thought I heard someone you not. Oh, no, you, you must have been mistaken. Well, I, I, I was lying down half a I beg your pardon. <laughs> your friend can do no wrong, Lindsay, but uh, I guess that doesn't include the counters. Hello, uh, let Mr. Benson and Dr. James come up with you. <laughs> this is going to be good. <laughs> Come in. Oh, hello, gentlemen. Uh, come in. Uh, sit down. Thank you. 
Don't get lost in thunder. Oh, no, there's no mistake. There is some destroyer that gives you a feed. But we only have your word for it. Well, that should be sufficient. But uh, a search of her room will quickly prove her innocence or her guilt. But it must be impossible to demand that. Well, we can't demand it unless we have a search warrant. And we'd have to go to search it for one. But uh, we can ask permission to search her room. How about it, gentlemen? Do I have your cooperation, or are you so here hoodwinked by the charming and beautiful countess that uh, you're going to let her get away with it, eh? Well, I suppose we'll have to face her with it. Now, there must be some other way. I can assure you, Doctor, there is isn't. Now, uh, Mr. Benson, hey, get this departure up here when we visit the counter so he can identify the stuff he's had stolen. And uh, you'd better get that dude wrangling deputy sheriff up here. After all, he has the authority to make the arrest in this county, and I haven't. Very well, I'll get them right away. Are you coming, Doctor? Uh, in a minute. Isn't there any way we can avoid this, Mr. Murphy? The poor Countess is not very well. I have been treating her. Yes, so I've noticed. And she really can't stand for the doctor. Listen, Doctor, you don't have to worry. What I saw out in the desert last night is your business. I've forgotten all about her. Right. What do you mean? Well, uh, do I have to go into details? I was out there last night. I was hearing her to see if she was standing over the stuff to a confederate. But, uh... I found out what stuff was being turned over was being turned over to you, and it wasn't stolen, it was given. Well, it's okay. That's uh, none of my business. Now, uh, I realize it puts you in a tough spot, but the dame is as guilty of these robberies as you are innocent, and it's my duty to see that she's put under arrest. Well, I am glad you appreciate my position. Appreciate it. <laughs> Doc, it has to be the best laugh I've had since I've been here. <laughs> minutes, a delegation composed of Murphy, Benton, Potter, the doctor, and the deputy sheriff is gathered outside the door of the lovely Countess Fraser. Mustering up his courage at last, Mr. Benton knocks timidly. It's, it's Mr. Benton, Countess. Yes, please. Did you hear that? Uh, can you hear that? Well, Mr. Benton, I, I didn't know you had friends with you. Well, it's this way. I think I'd better do the talking, Benton. Now, I don't think we've been introduced. I'm Detective Murphy of the Phoenix Police Department. You are an honest to gosh, Detective. I don't see how that can interest you. Well, it should. This uh, deputy sheriff here is to arrest you on a charge of suspicion of grand theft. This is preposterous. Mr. Benton, just a change. I thought the justice found in Texas Ranch would be treated otherwise. Why, I never heard of such a thing. You dare speak to the Countess Friday with such impertinence. I can assure you, if the Count were here, you would answer to the hot steel of your dueling Ah, oh, come on, Countess. Lay off the dramatic. Now, here's the situation. If uh, you permit us, we'd like to come in and search your room. If you ain't guilty, then you can sue the ranch for damages. Oh, don't, Mr. Benson. Don't suggest. Oh, okay. don't worry, Benson, old dear. I know what I'm talking about. Now, listen, Countess. If you want to be tough about it and refuse us permission to come in, you'll have to go to Prescott and get a search warrant. In the meantime, you'll be under the guard of this deputy, and uh, he won't allow you to leave the room. Will you, Sir Lock? Not a few thanks, old Captain. Thanks, Major. Now, Countess, uh, Prescott, a good six or eight miles, uh, uh, well, uh, at least uh, eight hours drive across the mountains, and there's snow up there at this time of the year, and uh, I'm in no hurry, so it is probably to be uh, two days before I got back with a warrant. And in the meantime, you're a prisoner. Now, how about it? Do uh, you want to let us take a look at you now, or do you want to sit around and bite your lovely nails for a couple of days? We're coming in anyway, and uh, if you're innocent, you've got nothing to worry about. And if you're as guilty as I know you are, you'll get it all over with right now. How do you know anything about my guilt or innocence? You uh, remember when I opened my door and asked if you'd knocked about a half an hour ago? Yes, I was on my way back from a sunlight. You were on your way back from Mr. Potter's where you stole $58 in mark money, a dozen pair of silk stockings, and a silver axe tray. All right, boys. I guess you got me. Come on in. What? 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 Count it. Yeah, count it. You'll find everything I've taken in his trunks. I haven't disposed of the things. Didn't intend to, I guess. Just 
Can't help taking things. Well, there's a sick name for that, isn't it, Doc? Yes, kleptomania. But count it, your ex senses. Gone, aren't you? Then you aren't a real countess? Nope. The kind of swallow is just plain Lorraine Frazier, Columbus, Ohio. He learned how to act in the drama club at college. Hey, Brenton, this is stuff that hasn't been reported lately. Look at this girl here. Four, five, three. What? There must be five hundred dollars worth of silver there. Yeah, hey, you ought to stand here silver after dinner every night, don't you? Uh-huh. What's this? A lot of pretties, huh? <laughs> Any of this stuff yours, Mr. Potter? Let me see. Uh, yes? Yes, these are my wife's nightgowns. Oh, the hundred dollar ones? Yes. Oh. <clears throat> don't look like more than uh, 875 to me. Hey, by the way, Murphy, I want you to know that I appreciate what you've done for us. Oh, that's quite all right. But I want you to have this. A small, concrete expression of the gratitude of Mrs. Potter and myself. Mm-hmm. It isn't much, just a little joke. Gee, hundred dollar bill. Well, I don't know, Mr. Potter. After all, I'm getting paid for this. I don't know whether Mr. Benson would like it if I accept any money from you. Of course, no. Well, uh, why don't you ask him? <laughs> Say, uh, Mr. Benton, is it all right to accept a little reward from Mr. Potter? Oh, certainly, yeah. Murphy. You've earned it. Well, oh, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Potter. How's the measure? Oh, uh, say, Benton, have you got change for a hundred dollar bill? Oh, yes, I think so. Five twenty, see all that? Yeah, sure. Anyway, I just feel better with money. I know how to spend. Well, that's what you call it, Mr. Potter. Yeah, that's right. Well, I never had seen a hundred dollar bill before and just wanted to make sure that if it was counterfeit, I wouldn't be stuck with it. Lorraine Frazier, alias the Countess Furlock, was a clear case of kleptomania. If she couldn't resist the impulse to steal, the law would have put her in prison for grand license as a prison offense. But in view of the fact that we recovered everything, she had stolen, aggregating more than $35,000 and upon recommendation to Mr. Benton and Mr. Potter, the girl was released on probation to her parents and returned to Columbus, Ohio. Shortly thereafter, she married, but two years later, during the winter, she died with the flu. Thank you, Sergeant Murphy. Ladies and gentlemen, we especially ask that every listener to tonight's program call upon the nearest Rio Grande class gasoline dealer and ask for a free copy of the Calling All Cars News. The new March issue is double sized full of extra movie and crime stories. And it tells all about the true crimes to be broadcast on future radio programs. Of special interest to every boy and girl are the many new free gifts illustrated in the Calling All Cars News. Magic police pictures, a G gun, a detective microscope, and a complete detective outfit of many items, all given free to users of Rio Grande Crack Gasoline. You will also find at every Rio Grande dealer a stock of Sinclair motor oils in cans. There is something unusual about these oils. They contain no paraffin wax, and all petroleum jelly has been extracted. This means that there is no waste bulk or filler, as you get in other oils. It is this useless, jelly-like material which stiffens in cold weather and thins out in hot weather, or at high speed until your motor gets very little lubrication. It costs you no more to get thin, clear canned oils, only 25 cents a quart for Opaline and 30 cents a quart for Pennsylvania. And you get only pure, concentrated oil that's guaranteed to lubricate perfectly at highest or lowest operating temperatures. Thin, clear motor oils owe their success like Rio Grande Crash Gasoline to a policy of greater value at the same price. Please, police, calling all cars, venting all cars, cancellation broadcast 119, regarding theft at the spine of Texas Ranch. Protective case now in custody. That's all. and produced by William N. Lopez.